Well, let's stand firmly upon the Catholic faith, but we have to ask, what is that Catholic faith? Well, I want to remind you of what the Council Fathers at the First Vatican Council accepted. Most of us know Vatican I for teaching papal infallibility, but in fact, it taught much more than that. And there was something that it taught in Pastor Eternus that speaks about the Bishop of Rome, generally speaking. And this is part of the Catholic faith. It says this. So the fathers of the Fourth Council of Constantinople, that's the Eighth Ecumenical Council, following the footsteps of their predecessors, published this solemn profession of faith. The first condition of salvation is to maintain the rule of the true faith. And since that saying of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, cannot fail of its effect, the words spoken are confirmed by their consequences, for in the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been preserved unblemished, and sacred doctrine been held in honor. Well, Strickland tells us, stand firm in the faith. Yes. And what does Vatican I say? about where we need to go to find what that faith is. Because I might have an opinion of what the faith is. You might have a different opinion. And some guy over there may have another opinion. And if that's all we have is opinions, then we're Protestants. Fortunately, Christ gave us something else. Not just opinions of what the Catholic faith is. But actually a way of knowing what the Catholic faith is. Despite a human ability to err. And it says, you'll know the Catholic faith by remaining in communion and following the teachings of the Apostolic See. Now, what is the Apostolic See? The Apostolic See is the Bishop of Rome. So what the Pope teaches, since what he teaches is preserved unblemished, and his see will always be unblemished, you know that you're standing firm in the faith if you're siding with the Pope. But for those who will say, I'm standing firm in the faith, therefore I'm resisting the Pope, well, we have a problem now. Because now we're in conflict with Vatican I. Certainly we can resist the Pope when he errs as a private person. I mean, Peter did that, right? He erred as a private person. And Paul resisted him to his face. That's legit. But what if the Pope is not acting as a private person he's teaching, such as in a post-synodal apostolic exhortation, which is what we're going to get after the Synod of Bishops? Well, now that's not acting as a private person. That's now acting in the capacity of the apostolic see, of which it is said by the Vatican Fathers. It has always been preserved unblemished, and this is not unique to Vatican I because they're quoting the Eighth Ecumenical Council, and this was not unique to the Eighth Ecumenical Council because it itself is quoting the formula of Hermisdus and also partially the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Agatho's letter specifically. And so really what you see here from Vatican I is kind of um, um, a... a uh, fulfillment of a long period of church history where over and over and over the magisterium has taught this idea. So this wasn't unique to Vatican I. You, Vatican I just merely brought forth a whole plethora of teachings from the deposit of faith. Well, from, yes, the deposit of faith, but also from the tradition of the church, especially in its councils. So what's going to happen is if somebody says, well, I'm going to dissent from Pope Francis because I think he's wrong, and I think he's not standing firm in the faith. Well, what happens is that person is behaving in a schismatic way. But with what we're seeing by a faulty definition of schism, somebody could say, well, I'm resisting Pope Francis because I'm standing firm in the faith, and therefore I'm not schismatic. And so when we have faulty definitions of schism, and we're ambiguous in what we're saying there, people can misunderstand it and think that they're confirming the faith when in fact they're abandoning the faith. They could think that they're remaining firm in the Catholic Church when in fact they're abandoning the Church. How do you know you're in the Church? Are you following the Apostolic See? What it teaches? Are you following it? Or are you resisting it?
If you're following the teachings of the apostolic see, you're in good Catholic faith. If you are resisting the apostolic see's teachings, you're not in full communion. That's according to these councils and the Code of Canon Law. The council continues, since it is our earnest desire to be in no way separated from this faith and doctrine, we hope that we may deserve to remain in that one communion which the apostolic see preaches. For in it, the whole and true strength of the Christian religion. For in it is the whole and true strength of the Christian religion. But some are resisting the apostolic see today in its teachings. And they're saying, no, the apostolic see is wrecking the faith and devastating the faith and is abandoning tradition and is teaching heresy. Well, according to this in Vatican I, that's not possible because the apostolic see always will be unblemished. And Agatho, which they're partly quoting from at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, says it will be unblemished unto the end. That is forever. And the Catholic faith has always been preserved, unblemished in this apostolic fee, uh, see, because in it is the whole and true Christian religion. But some are saying, no, the apostolic see is fighting against the Christian religion, is separating itself from the faith, is blemished, is tarnished. Well, unfortunately, such people have separated themselves from the Catholic faith. Because that is not what Vatican I and many councils prior to that and what Scripture teaches. And yet, some people who are saying these things are doing so in the name of tradition. They say, I'm being traditional by resisting the teachings of Rome. Well, according to Vatican I, that's incoherent and contradictory. By definition, you're not being traditional. Because tradition, sacred tradition says, that's not possible. That doesn't mean the Pope can't make a mistake. It also doesn't mean the Pope can't teach an error in his magisterium. He could. But the error will never be to the extent that it solely's the Catholic faith. It will always be, at the most, something that is still in accord with the substance of the faith as a whole. Never a direct violation. Never heresy, in other words. It will never be an error to that extent. And yet there are people who are saying, the Pope is teaching heresy in his teachings. This papal document teaches heresy. Or this new synod is going to teach heresy. Well, if what you mean by that is the Pope is going to teach in his post-synodal apostolic exhortation heresy, an attempt to change the unchanging faith, well, might I submit to you that you're no longer holding to the faith of the First Vatican Council. And you might need to examine yourself at that point. Because in the name of tradition, you've abandoned tradition. And isn't that exactly what Satan wants from you? Does he want to doesn't he want to pull the wool over your eyes and make you think that you're traditional when in fact you're not? Does he not want you to think the error is traditional? Does he, does he not want you to follow the path that leads to destruction and make you think that it's a good and holy and traditional path? I am certain that Satan will take plenty of people who want to follow tradition and want to follow Christ, and he will have them believing that all sorts of errors are the teachings of Jesus Christ in our tradition. But we have an objective way of knowing what tradition and truth is for those who are remaining firm in the teachings of the apostolic see. But those who are resisting the apostolic see, make no mistake about it. You're fighting against the faith. So Reason and Theology is growing as a channel. As a result, there's been a number of increases in production costs. 
So if you're benefiting from RNT, I ask that you consider supporting the channel. You can help out by contributing to the Help RNT Grow fundraiser on GoFundMe. You could also consider becoming a member on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology or become a channel member right here on YouTube. With either of these options, Patreon or a YouTube member, you'll get extra access to patron only content. You can also donate directly to RNT at PayPal if you prefer that option. And you can find links to all of these resources and ways to support RNT in the show description. God bless. Well, not only this from Vatican I, but let me also remind you more explicitly of Gasser's speech of Vatican I in his relatio. Bishop Gasser, a very prominent figure at Vatican I, gives a relatio a speech prior to the bishops voting on this document that we just looked at. Prior to them voting on that document, the bishop gives a speech explaining what they're about to vote on. Now we know they accepted the document. When they voted, they accepted it. And in this speech, he tells them, here's how you're to understand what you're about to vote on. So in other words, what the bishops at Vatican I accepted in accepting Pastor Eternus is to be understood in light of this speech. So if you want a good interpretation of Vatican I and what that document means, you look to the relatio because it tells you what it means. It's not a part of the magisterium, but it has interpretive authority. So it's not a document of the council, but it has interpretive authority for the document of the council. So if you want to understand the document of the council, you have to go to the Relatio. Now, I highly recommend that you read the entire Relatio, but I want to pull this section for um, paragraph eight, and we're going to read it together. Because I think, unfortunately... Many of us think that we're traditional, and in fact, we've abandoned the tradition expressed by Vatican I. The fathers accepted this, this prerogative granted to St. Peter by the Lord Jesus Christ was supposed to pass to all Peter's successors because the chair of Peter is the center of unity in the church. One of the reasons why the Eastern Orthodox are so divided and cannot be united in, in, in teaching and in governance is because they lack this center of unity, which is the Bishop of Rome. But if the pontiff should fall into an air of faith, well, If the Pope is teaching heresy, that would be an error of faith, right? If the Pope should fall into an error of faith, well, if the Pope is seeking to change that which is unchangeable, that would be an error of faith, right? Yes. But if the pontiff should fall into an error of faith, the church would dissolve. Full stop. The church would dissolve. Deprived of the bond of unity. Let me stop right there. A lot of us who uphold tradition knowingly do not actually uphold tradition. Unknowingly, I should say, we do not uphold tradition. Uh, We're violating tradition. Because some of us who attempt to uphold tradition are contradicting this. We say no. The Pope has fallen into error. The Pope is teaching heresy. The Pope is waging war against the Catholic Church. Resist him. Resist him to his face. And then they'll misquote Scripture. And they'll misquote Aquinas. Or rather, they'll misunderstand Scripture and misunderstand Aquinas and misunderstand other precedents in church history, such as Honorius, which I've covered at length here on this channel. Abuse some of those things and say, See? Resist the Pope, because he's teaching heresy. But now hold on, wait a moment. That doesn't make sense. 
Resist the Pope. He's trying to change the unchanging faith. He's at war with the church. Well, wait. The Vatican I fathers didn't believe that. The Vatican I fathers, and Pastor Eterna said, no, this sea is unblemished and will always be, and then says that if the Pope should fall into an era of faith, the church would dissolve and be deprived of the bond of unity because the Bishop of Rome is the principle of unity. So if he falls into an era of faith, the church dissolves. The whole thing falls apart. Can you really have a, a wheel without a rim? Well, not a good working one, right? <laughs> it, would, it would collapse almost immediately, right? Under the weight of the car. The, the outer part of the wheel, for it to be intact and really to hold the weight of the vehicle, it has to have that rim, that middle part. But if the rim collapses, well, the, the whole thing's going to collapse at that point. Well, if the Pope is the principle of unity and he is falling into an era of faith, the whole thing is going to fall. The whole thing is going to collapse. But aren't you hearing people who are saying, I'm upholding tradition. I'm traditional. But they're opposing this. And they're saying the Pope is waging war on the church. He's teaching heresy. But wait, I thought this was the Catholic faith. What you're bringing to me is another gospel. What you're bringing to me is what Strickland was warning against, right? Those who are not upholding the Catholic faith, those who are preaching a false gospel, it's not in accord with this. And then it continues. It gets worse. The Bishop of Mo speaks very well on this point, saying, if this Roman sea could fall, and be no longer the sea of truth, but of air and pestilence. Then the Catholic Church herself would not have the bond of a society and would be schismatic and scattered, which is in fact impossible. Why does he say this? Because he is operating with a correct definition of schism. And he's not operating with ambiguity and a faulty and incomplete definition of schism. Rather, he's operating with the correct one. What holds the church together, the bond of a society, is going to be the principal see, the apostolic see, the bishop of Rome. Those who are not in accord with him are scattered. But here he says, but if that's true, and it is true, but if the bishop of Rome falls into error and becomes a sea of pestilence, then the whole thing scatters in the exact same way that if you don't have that rim for the car, I mean, for the tire, the whole thing's going to collapse. But I don't think we believe that, so many of us. We think we're traditional. We say, I'm traditional. And then we misunderstand scripture, misunderstand church history, and then violate the First Vatican Council. And we say, no, the Sea of Rome is leading people to apostasy. The Sea of Rome is heresy. It's teaching heresy. It's teaching error. <clears throat> it's waging war against the saints. It's waging war against tradition. Resist the Sea of Rome. Because they're not just speaking about maybe something that Pope Francis says as a private person. They're saying what the Pope is saying in his capacity as Pope. They're saying, resist those things. Fight against them. But wait. You're saying the Sea of Rome has become a sea of air and pestilence. And according to Vatican I, if that's true, your whole thing falls apart. And this is why many people who are listening to these voices in the Catholic Church who are saying these things, they're saying, resist Rome. It's teaching heresy. When a person hears that and they listen to it and they carry it to its logical conclusion, they're going to carry it to the conclusion that Vatican warned Ward against, and that is the bond of the society is going to be scattered. In other words, the claims of the Catholic Church fall apart. And people are going to see that and they're going to say, well, you know what? If Pope Francis is in fact teaching heresy and it, it, you know the apostolic sea has become a sea of error, it's no longer guardian, guarding the tradition, but the sea itself, 
like the teachings of the Bishop of Rome, are fighting against tradition, fighting against the faithful. Well, people are going to carry that to its logical conclusion and say, the whole thing falls apart. I'm leaving. I'm going to Eastern Orthodoxy. Or I'm going to Protestantism. Or I'm leaving Christianity altogether. I'm going to Islam. Or I'm going to this. Or I'm going to that. Or I'm just going to become agnostic. Or I'm going to become an atheist. They'll leave elsewhere. And they are leaving and going elsewhere. Make no mistake about it. They're leaving. Because they're listening to the voices that are saying these things. And they're saying, yeah, Rome has become a sea of air and pestilence. And they say, well, why would I be in communion with such a church? The whole thing falls apart. And they're right. If that's true, then yeah, why would you waste your time in the Catholic Church? But the problem is, they're wrong. The voices that are saying those things, they're wrong. The Church in Rome, the Sea of Rome, the Apostolic Sea, is not a sea of pestilence or air. The Church in the Pope is not teaching heresy. Whatever faults the Pope may have, his magisterium is not contradicting the faith, waging war against the faith, none of the above. It's upholding. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see the full video, go to the link in the description. And also, while you're at it, hit the subscribe button. God bless. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.